to you. We updated afresh the, the app, Living Empowered by the Holy Spirit, so now we're switching gears into this series. And my first question to you this morning is, are you living empowered? Are you living empowered? Because there's a difference, right? Just getting by. And it seemed like this last week that I was just getting by. Right after Resurrection Sunday, I was hit with a cold flu type of little combination combo. And it wasn't fun. And I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit angry at God because I knew there was 75 and 85 degree weather coming. I wanted to get out there fishing, right? And so I was like, Lord, what in the heck is going on here? But I kept my mind frame. And I uh, did not succumb to the enemy's tactics saying, you see, here's what the enemy does, right? You see, you do God's work, you preach, you study, and look what he does to you. He's just punishing you. God doesn't like you. He hates you. Why don't you just quit? Now, now you're a little bit quiet this morning, but tell me that isn't true, that the devil doesn't say to you every single week, why don't you just quit at whatever it may be? Maybe not your job, maybe your marriage, relationship, you name it, whatever. Why don't you just quit? Why don't you just throw in the towel? And life can do that to us, right? It can drain us. And if you read the opening monologue in your church application, not right now, please wait uh, till later. But it talks about when we first get saved, right, there's that fire in our bellies. There's that fire in our bellies that Christ Jesus just did something in me and set me free from pain, addiction, sorrow, sin, all that stuff and junk. And there's a fire in us. And that fire is like it can't be contained. And we want to tell other people about Jesus. And we're walking around the workplace or our homes or our neighborhoods or whatever it, want, it may want to be. And we want to tell somebody about Jesus or give a testimony or whatever it may be. But then life happens. And then we fail to proclaim the name of Jesus. We fail to let our light shine on a daily basis, monthly if we're lucky. Whose fault is that? Is that God's fault? Is God dead? Is the Holy Spirit dead? Or is that our problem? So are you living empowered? And I want to point out before I pray, here's our connections. You know them if you've been around here. But here's our church app. Here's how to get it if you need to get that. Here's our social media connections as well. You can download, not download them, but you can go to those, like them, and you will get notifications when sermons are posted. Uh, bear with me. My throat is a little bit raspy, and so I need to just get a little sip of water here, and then we'll pray. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity. Lord, that we can meet together as brothers and sisters. That we can talk about hard subjects, Lord, that we can encourage each other. Lord, your word challenges us. It causes us to rise up. It causes us, Lord, uh, to check ourselves and wipe the dust off. Lord, it, it, it convicts us of, of things that we need to do away with in our lives. Because, Lord, you're a God of restoration. You're a God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances, Lord, because you chase after us. You love us, Lord. And let people know that you love them this morning, Heavenly Father. You're in love with them, and you want them, Lord, to Jesus, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we pray that on the congregation, before this sermon even goes forward, that the Holy Spirit would be in this room right now in Jesus' name that the loud noise of this last week would flee in Jesus' name. And people would be zoned in on what you're saying to us this morning. It's in the name of your spirit we pray. Amen. Why is there so much confusion about the Holy Spirit amongst churches and Christians? 
Let me say this. The Holy Spirit isn't a weirdo or someone you should shy away from. But there's tension. In case you didn't know this, there's tension about the Holy Spirit. That's why we got uh, so many denominations out there. The Holy Spirit isn't the weirdo. People are. Excuse my opinion about that. And I'm not calling you a weirdo. Maybe Lois. She just said, yes, I am, so. And in case you're listening online, I'm not calling you a weirdo either. The Holy Spirit is God. Right? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. But the Holy Spirit has gotten a bad rap because people have abused the Spirit's power. When I was growing up, my parents um, used to tell me about my aunt's church. And I'm not going to tell you who my aunt was because some of you may know my aunt. And so we're just going to need leave that anonymous, and she went to a church, and my parents talk about people rolling down the aisles on Sunday morning. It was called, I mean, uh, a holy roller church, I guess. I mean, you, you familiar with that term? Maybe you rolled down, the, I was just thinking, maybe you were some of the ones rolling down those aisles. I don't know. I'm not judging here this morning. I don't know, but there was churches known as holy roller churches, do you remember those? I mean, I, I just remember my parents talking about that. I, you know, I didn't see that. Uh, we visited there one time, and as a young teenager, I, I uh, went to the restroom, as we often need to do, and I walk into the restroom, and there's this guy, and he happened, I'm just saying, I'm just being real with you, by the urinal doing push-ups. He's blocking my... Entrance. And this guy, I mean, you know, if you walk into the bathroom and there's somebody doing push-ups, you need to tell an elder or me or something, right? I mean, you could do push-ups somewhere, but do them in the back or something. This guy's doing push-ups, and I'm just kind of standing there as a young teenager like, do I run? Do I scream? What do I do? Do I get on his back and see if he can pump me, right? <clears throat> and he... Quickly looks up at me and he goes, I'm just filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like, all right, and then I just hit the door, right? And I quickly went to my dad and I said, Dad, there's a guy in the bathroom doing push-ups and he's filled with the Spirit. And my dad quickly said to me, he says, just come next to me and sit here, right? <laughs> True story. True story. Nothing against my aunt's church, whatever the case may be, whatever. I'm just saying. Sometimes the spirit gets misused. Now, um, in the middle 90s, uh, the Vineyard Church, the airport Vineyard Church in Toronto, you went there. I knew there would be some. And, and it was called the Toronto Blessing. It was a major outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Anybody been to the Toronto Blessing? Okay. People from all over the world went to the Toronto Blessing. Uh, and it was, a, it was a magnificent thing. It was, it was before I went and got into the vineyard, and so I did not have the privilege of attending that. But one of the problems in the meetings, and there was prophetic words and healings and all sorts of wonderful things that were of the Spirit of God, there were some manifestations that just couldn't be lined up with God's word. And some of those manifestations were people roaring like lions and barking like dogs. And I'm, yeah, you can laugh, it's okay. And so the vineyard, you know, it was getting disorderly, and we had a group over, let's just say, in this section, they were barking like dogs over here. I'll go to Lois' side. And then there was people over here roaring like lions. And so the vineyard said, you know, we can't deny that the Holy Spirit 
is moving, but there's just some things that we can't associate with Scripture, and it's getting a little disorderly here, and we need to do something and say something. And so they needed to step in, and they needed to intervene, and they needed to say, like, look, and they met down with the, the pastor and the association and all that stuff, and they basically just said to them, I'm making a long story short, it's like, you know, we don't see this in Scripture, and we need to align ourselves with God's Word. Right? Because, you know, we can misuse the Holy Spirit. We literally can say, well, that was of the Spirit, and use that for an excuse. When, when it was just the bad chocolate milk that we just drank this morning. But we say it's the Spirit. Or we think it's the Spirit, and it's not the Spirit, and we just use it loosely. Right, And so we need, to be, we need to be cognizant of that and we need to be aware of that, that we're not misusing the Holy Spirit or, 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 or d- disrupting God or whatever the case may be. And so to end that story, it, it was simply like, listen, you guys either conform to what we're doing here in, our, in, in, in kind of our thing or you need to do something different. And so they decided that they needed to do something different. And so the vineyard said, okay, God bless you, have a great day. And uh, I think they're still going strong. I'm not really sure about the whole thing, but uh, that's just the way it rolls. But the fact is, here's the fact. Sometimes the Holy Spirit does look a little messy or what we would call weird. I'm not calling God weird. I want you to understand something. Or weird, right? Now let me give you an example of that in Mark chapter 8. Now this is not what we typically do when you come to altar ministry here. Jesus spit in a man's eyes. <laughs> now that's not necessarily normal. If I say, friends, you know, the Holy Spirit, and I'm not saying, I, you know, the minute I say this, then the Holy Spirit's going to do this. But, but if, I, if I said out loud, right, and you didn't have no reference in the Bible, like, Listen, the Holy Spirit just told me for you to come up here and I'm going to spit on your eyes this morning in Jesus' name. You'd be like, man, this church is weird. But the fact of the matter is Jesus did that very thing. As he was led by the Spirit, and there's a whole, there's a whole theology behind that and the cultural kind. So I'm not going to get into that this morning, but sometimes the Holy Spirit looks messy. So messy that there could be vomit that projects out of people's mouths when demons come out. I'm being honest with you. I've been there, done it, do it. Okay? So sometimes the Holy Spirit can look a little messy, but that doesn't mean that we stop the Holy Spirit. And unfortunately, what some Christian churches have done is they've stopped the Holy Spirit. And they've stopped making disciples of Jesus Christ. And they're more concerned with new miracle growth and fancy entertainment concerts up front instead of doing the work of Jesus Christ, period. Just do a search, look at them online or whatever. We're not, the church should not be in the entertainment business. We're in the God business of saving souls, helping you live empowered, and being disciples of Jesus Christ. Anybody can hire a rock band and put them on stage and draw people. Right? And so we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, and we do the Holy Spirit stuff, but the reality is, is there's this tension. There's churches, did you know, that don't allow the raising of hands during praise and worship. And I know individuals that have told me over the years and over the years and over the years that when they attended those churches in the past, that people would kindly come up to them, or whatever the case may be, and said, you need to put your hand down during praise and worship. And there's churches, and I'm going to tell you this, that believe that the miracles have ceased. I don't want them praying for me. 
Now, I'm not exaggerating that fact, and you'll be surprised. There is some world-renowned theologians and doctors in theology that some of you listen to, and I'm not saying they're not good teachers and good teachers, but I'm not even going to mention one because I just don't feel I should do that this morning. But put it this way, about 12 years ago, I had to pull over the side of the road. I listened to this guy about on a daily basis on the way home from work, and he was talk. I couldn't believe it. He was talking why there was no more miracles. It's called sensationism. And he was given into this sermon and why the Holy Spirit, blah, 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 and there's no more miracles. And I'm just like, what Bible are you reading? What the, and this guy's a doctor. I mean, a doctor that writes a lot of books in this country and has a lot of people. And I'm like, He's a good Christian man. I'm not saying like he's lost his salvation or anything like this. But I'm saying his theology, even though he's super like smart, he's like a little bit, right? Thank you. A little bit off. And so there's this tension about the Holy Spirit. And here's, here's my thought on the matter. I believe there's millions of Christians in churches missing out of blessings of the Holy Spirit and the empowerment of it because they snuff the Holy Ghost out. And I'm telling you something right now. (laughs) I've said this a lot. If you you go go to a church and a pastor or elder or anyone tells you to put your hand down during praise and worship that we don't do that there, leave that church today. Because that's not God's word. Understand the context. I'm not coming against the pastor or whatever. I'm just saying that's not the New Testament church, period. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that, right? I'm not saying that you have to, you know, raise your hands and jump up and down and all that. That's, that's, you know, it's an individual approach to worship. But if you're told to stop, if you're... I mean, would, would you tell somebody to stop praying for somebody and laying hands on somebody in church? It's the same thing. And so here's what, ha- here's what has happened. So pastors and churches can't explain why when they lay hands on somebody and miracles don't happen or they go to a hospital bed or whatever the case may be, and it doesn't happen the way they want it to happen, so then they say miracles have ceased. And they use some New Testament passage to support them. It's not good systematic theology. It's bogus. And so because they can't, uh, so let me just put it to you this way. Every person that we share the salvation message with doesn't get saved right then, do they? So do we just stop? Do we stop telling others about Jesus? And every person that we pray for, for healing for, it just doesn't go the way we want it to go sometimes, right? But sometimes the supernatural God just heals right then and there. Or sometimes it takes two weeks or a month or a year, whatever it can. But we don't stop doing that because God doesn't roll the way we want him to roll. The Holy Spirit rolls how God wants to roll, and that's how we need it. And that's a good place. And that's a good thing. Because if we could just click our fingers and everything happened, then we would all be gods. Just like this world thinks they are. This world thinks they're gods. Right? Because anybody that says that a child is born can be, hey, let's just ask the child what they are. That's just messed up. Let me just say this. That's not even good science. Wow. Anyways. So I'll say this before we transition. We are a church that believes in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Right? And and we're not ashamed of that. And we will move into that. And, and I'm, here to, I'm here to announce a couple of things this morning that during that whole COVID thing, whatever you want to call it, I don't want to get into name calling, whatever, 
our altar ministry, you know, people touching all this different sort of stuff that our altar ministry has kind of fizzled after church a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm the pastor of the church, and I'm saying that right out loud. But I'm going to tell you right now, starting next Sunday, because I didn't have time to line a bunch of different things up, starting next Sunday, after church altar ministry will be opened again every single week like we used to do it before. Because miracles happen. We got good disciples of Jesus Christ that know how to pray. And so we'll walk into that in a little bit. And I'm here to announce this morning, and you might want to mark this down in your calendar, but we will be announcing this. May the 19th, we're having a revival night here at the church. We're bringing in a guest speaker, uh, Clay Harrington from Cincinnati, Ohio. He's a wonderful man of God, and we're going to have some, maybe, whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. Maybe some prophecy, healing, whatever. So May the 19th, mark that on your calendars. So we believe in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, but we're also a church that believes in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 14, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Right? Uh, so we need to be aware of that, so we don't go out of bounds, and so that we don't just say, well, that's of the Spirit, and I just take this tithe box and say, hey, we need to give this morning. Here's what the Spirit says. Right? That, I mean, we just, we're not going to do that. We're not going to start barking like dogs and roaring like lions. So let's break the Holy Spirit down uh, in its original languages, just to show you this very quickly. I'm, I know I'm shying away from my outline a little bit, but I think we have this up there. Hebrew word is rukah, meaning breath and wind, and the Greek word is essentially the same, pneuma, meaning breath as well. Theologian Wayne Grudem says this, the Holy Spirit in its most foundational form, expresses the idea of power, energy, and life. Power, energy, and life. And as Christians, we get a deposit of the Holy Spirit when we invite Jesus Christ into our lives. Right? And so let's turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3, Verses 5 through 8, these are Jesus' words. And there's this whole theology here. Nicodemus, you, you, you know this story. I'm not going to get into Nicodemus. Nicodemus basically comes to, to Jesus, right? And he says, like, you know, how can you be doing this stuff? Like, nobody could do these miracles like you're doing we don't get it, and so Jesus says this to him, and we're going to pick this up in verses uh, uh, 4. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Like, you know, how, how, how can this happen? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. Numa, capital S, the Holy Spirit, right? And then it identifies this supernatural thing. Flesh gives birth to flesh, right? A mother gives birth to a child. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. It's a supernatural thing. The Holy Spirit gives supernatural uh, ability to our spirit to come alive in Jesus. And then he goes on to say in verse 7, you should not be surprised at me saying this. He's talking to Nicodemus. You must be Born again. And then he gives an analogy. The wind, pneuma, blows where it pleases, 
You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You see, we can't save ourselves, friends. It's a God thing. It's a supernatural thing, right? Where we have to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Jesus made it that simple. Praise be to God. And then Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 39, if you'd turn there. Peter essentially says the same thing as Jesus. Now, this is in the book of Acts. The ascension just happened. And after the ascension of Christ, the church absolutely exploded. When you see the resurrected Lord, everything changes in your life. Right? So they saw the resurrected Lord, and they followed and did what he said, and they followed and did exactly what he did in the gospel accounts. They laid hands on the sick, they preached the word of God, and on and on we can go. And so the outpouring of the Holy Spirit occurs. Peter gives this wonderful sermon, and then these people said this. They, they were convicted. Uh, have you ever been convicted? I've been convicted on several occasions. Sometimes when I'm driving down the road, I get convicted. I'll be honest with you. They were convicted after his sermon, and in Acts uh, 2, verses 37 through 39, when the people heard this, that was when they heard the message, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Because he basically said, you killed Jesus. Like, you killed Jesus. You killed the Messiah. But God raised him from the dead and he went into this big, long sermon. And so these people are like, oh my goodness, they were convicted. What shall we do? And Peter responds as the risen Christ responded in the Great Commission. Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Now you say, well, God, I have to be baptized to get into heaven? No, baptism is not absolutely essential for you to get into heaven. You should do it, right? It, it, you should do it immediately when you can after your salvation. But if you can't, the thief on the cross didn't have an opportunity to do that. Yet Jesus said to him, today you shall be with me in paradise. So this was, follow, so this was following uh, Jesus' uh, creeds and what he said, be baptized and, 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 and repent. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and what happens? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here's the good news. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. Now, on two separate occasions, Apostle Paul reminds the Christians in the book of Romans this fact. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. And he said that twice to these early Christians. And I suppose that we need to be reminded about that at times in our lives. That the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of me. And so when the devil's on my back, when I'm having that downcast day, when something isn't right financially or whatever, and the Satan says, you need to quit, I need that spirit of God to rise up in me and come against the satanic attack. Right in Jesus' name. Now, let me say 
these quick three facts, and then I want to read something very important as it gets uh, mixed up a lot. These are three quick facts about the scripture we just read. Three truths. The Holy Spirit lives inside anyone who commits their life to Jesus. The Holy Spirit equips us to reveal Jesus to others. But here's the deal. If we're not living empowered lives, then we're just going to shrink back. When the Lord gives us an opportunity, if we're not living in the Spirit, we're not going to be prepped or prepared to give a response to the enemy's attack or to the door the Lord flings wide open, right? When we come to life spiritually, uh, we, we come to life spiritually by birth, the birthing of the Holy Spirit. I want to read something to you in the app. Very important. Scholar David Guzik says this, and he's talking about this whole idea where sometimes we as Christians or as charismatic or Pentecostals, whatever you classify yourself, say, hey, they're spirit-filled people. And we kind of differentiate between being spirit-filled and those people don't have the Holy Ghost and those people that have the Holy Ghost. Well, here's what David Kuzik says, and I believe it's theologically very accurate and very sound. He says, the Holy Spirit is given to each believer when they are born again. Every Christian has within themselves a principle higher and more powerful than the flesh. This means every believer has the Holy Spirit. It's a misnomer to divide Christians among the Spirit-filled and the non-Spirit-filled if a person is not filled, now listen to this, it's, if a person is not filled with the Holy Spirit, they are not a Christian at all. Think about that. However, many do miss out. Many do miss out on living a Christian life in constant fullness of the Spirit. Right? Right? And so there's this static quo Christianity, like I've saved, I've done my duty, and then we're just kind of like stagnant maybe Christians, or we're just kind of going through life, and we don't maybe necessarily believe in the supernatural, we're not laying our hands on individuals, we're not calling things that are not as though they were, and we become lackadaisical, and that fire inside of our belly can go slowly dim. But the Lord wants us filled with his spirit, filled with his power, renewed and ready to go and hit the day and have breakthroughs in our lives. Because I don't want somebody that doesn't believe that miracles can happen praying for me when I need a miracle, right? I want the Holy Ghost to rise up in my Christian family and friends that believe in miracles because we're going to do this thing. We're going to hold hands with the Holy Spirit because wasn't it Jesus that said, Thy kingdom come. How do you get around this? Thy will be done on heaven as it is on earth. Right? So, in other words, sometimes the Lord breaks off a piece of heaven and gives it to us. But if we're not praying for that piece of heaven to be broken off in our lives, we're just not going to get it, are we? If we don't come to the table, we're not going to get that good steak dinner, whatever the case may be. So I have a serious question for you this morning. How is the Holy Spirit impacting your life? When I was, again, a young teenager, my, my dad and mom got me this Swin bicycle. I think I, I pulled a, I think I got that there. It was like the 80s. It might be worth like $1,000 if I had it. Anyways, they got me this. It's, it's a Stingray Schwinn. And 
I had this banged up bike, and I was a, a, you know, a typical boy that built ramps. Anybody ever built ramps when they were a kid and just like, get that bike going, you just, you know, you know I'm not giving, you monitor your own kids, all right? Monitor your own kids, but I was one of those kids, right? We just played outside. We didn't have smart gadgets. You can TikTok and YouTubers and all that stuff. It's like we just played in the olden days. <laughs> That's what we call it now, right? And so my, my mom and dad gave me this nice twin bike, and it was so nice I didn't want to ding it up. And so essentially I would ride it around a little bit, but when my friends came over, we wanted to jump our bikes and build those ramps and jump over as many bricks and blocks as we could, you know, those, those sand things. I didn't use the Schwinn bicycle because I didn't want it to get banged up. And, and here's the deal. I just didn't know how good that thing was. Until it was sitting all there pretty and fancy and, and it was, you know, and I'd ride it around a little bit and my friends really, you know, they, they knew about it, but it was kind of tucked away. And my dad said to me one day, he goes, son, you need to ride that Schwinn bicycle. And let me just tell you something. I took that Schwinn bicycle out, and I did those jumps, man, and I landed over more bricks than I've ever landed before, and I jumped, and I landed, and I rode it, and I mean, it was the best bike you could ever have. But it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. When we get it, if we just leave it tucked in the closet, what good is it? Because you cannot deny the fact in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on all people to fulfill that prophetic word, that people's lives and ministries didn't look the same again. So my question still stands, how is the Holy Spirit impacting your life? Because we need to be walking around with fire and power in our bellies and our souls, speaking life. And when the Holy Spirit gives us an opportunity, I don't care if it's in a shopping mall, if it's in Kroger, if it's at a gas pump, if you hear the Holy Spirit's voice say, talk to this person, or pray for this person, or say something, or do something, we better be doing it, because if we're not, we're missing out on God opportunities day in and day out, because the fire in our bellies have grown dim. And not too many people are talking about it because you want to know what they're doing? During praise and worship music, they're holding their hands down and telling everybody to be chained up. That's not the Bible. That's not the book of Acts. When this thing takes off, it explodes. And I want to close with this because I can go on this for a long time. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Paul says in Galatians 5.16, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Live. Live. Live by the Holy Spirit. It's a daily thing. It's not just like, hey, man, I, something really bad happened. Come on out, Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes like we blame God for a lot of different things, but it's us that needs to be the blame for, right? We blame God. We just want to pull that Holy Spirit of comfort every time we want to pull the Holy Spirit out of the closet and say, sick him, Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's like to use, like, where have you been lately? Where's your fire been for the last 10 years? What have you been doing for me? Are you listening to me? I told you to talk to that person. I told you to pray for that person. I told you to do this or that. And you're like, well, I didn't hear anything. 
because you got your earplugs in. And your life is so stinking busy, and I say this to myself as well, we're missing out. I want to live a life of fire. I want to live a life of power. I want to have breakthroughs. I want to see people have, I want to see my family have breakthroughs. You see, I want to, when we pray, we pray with power and fire power, right? Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of us. And so Paul says, so I say, live by the spirit and do not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. You see, that's what happens sometimes. That sinful nature grabs a hold of us, then drags us to the side. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. You don't do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under legalism. You are not under the law, he's saying. You're not constrained. You don't have to Worship with your hands down. Praise God. Then he goes into a thing. You know, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who, now listen, live like this. Not like, well, you know, I just messed up last night. There's forgiveness in Christ, Jesus Christ's blood. But there's a difference living like this. Now, you're not going to hear this in a lot of churches. This is the word of God. You argue with God. I'm, don't argue with me. But here's what the scripture says. Those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you say, well, man, that's pretty... No, that's good. Because guess what? The heaven I'm going to, the heaven you're going to, none of this stuff is going to be there. Hallelujah? None of this worldly garbage, this wokeism and dokeism and all this different stuff, it's not going to be there because evil cannot stand in the presence of God. That's why Satan got the boot, Right? And so, friends, I choose to live by the Spirit of God. And I might be a little bit crazy, uh, you know, whatever. You call me what you want to call me, but I'm going to tell you something. I walk in the power of the Holy Ghost because Jesus said, I can, right? So stand with me as we close this morning. And we're going to be rolling into some good stuff, so stay with me on this sermon series. And I just want to pray, I just want to pray in closing. If you, if you just need to be relit, just, you, you're fire, you, you, maybe you're just missing out, you're not, you're not in tune, the busyness of life, there's nothing to be ashamed, we're in the house of God. And you just need that fire to just light up in you. You need more God. You need more God encounters. Because you haven't had a God encounter maybe in a long time where you just felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to move. And if you, let me just say, if you're not prompted by the Holy Spirit to move on quite a regular basis, then, man, your fire has gone dim. And so if that's you this morning, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, but that fire can return to you. And so with every eye closed this morning, I just ask that you would raise your hand to God, and I'm just going to say a closing prayer over to you. If you want more of the fire of God in your life, just raise your hand to heaven. going to wait on the Holy Spirit right now. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, these are your people and their hands are raised to you because they want more of you. 
more of you, Lord. More of God encounters, more fire in their souls. Lord, give them ears to hear of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, your word said that you blew on them and they received the Holy Spirit, Lord. And so, Lord, we just, we just Lord, use the fresh wind of Numa, Lord, the, the, the wind of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ right now, Lord, as saints are standing before you right now with holy hands lifted high, they're saying more, God. I ask right now, in Jesus' name, you would give them more. Holy Spirit, more. Fall on them. Fall on them. A fresh anointing. A fresh spirit, Heavenly Father, where they hear the Holy Spirit moving in their mind, in their body, in their mouths. I ask you to increase their prayer life in Jesus' name. I ask you to increase their prayer language in Jesus' name. I ask you to increase their evangelistic ability in Jesus' name, Lord, right now. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, fall. Holy Spirit, do your work in people's lives. Show them your power. Show them your love. Show them your anointing. Show them, Lord. Yes, Lord. Show them that you're real. Again. And Lord, remind them that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of them. So do your work. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would roll. Roll. Like you rolled the tomb away. Lord, you rolled the tomb away. And Lord, people's lives were never the same again. Lord, we don't want the status quo anymore. Something has to change. We don't want to just be just just walking through life lackadaisical and lazy. We want to be empowered. We want to be encouraged. So breathe on your people, Lord, this morning. Breathe on your people on the internet this morning. Lord, YouTube, Facebook, breathe your Holy Spirit on them. The Holy Spirit fire in Jesus' name over their mind, body, and soul. Jesus, we pray for the churches in America. Lord, we pray for the churches of America that have become silenced, that have become dormant, that have become entertainment clubs rather than making disciples of Jesus Christ. Lord, light their fire. Light their fire, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that this revival of Acts would spread all across this country in Jesus' name, Lord. Where people would come to Jesus Christ and you would set our nation free. So we love you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for meeting with us today. Help us, Lord, as we face today and face this next week. But Lord, we are filled with your spirit. In this we rejoice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad you came to church? You are dismissed. Have a great day. I will see you next Sunday or in between.